As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. And those are the vast few verses that we're going to concentrate on this morning, verse 11 and 12. Now you remember last week we were looking at John's Gospel and um, you remember John says that in his Gospel that in order that we might believe that Jesus was Israel's Messiah and as a result of believing we might have eternal life. Now some people will call that easy believism. It's very easy to believe and that's it. Say this prayer and you'll be all right. But is it easy believism when you stake your eternal welfare on a promise of a, on a book written thousands of years ago? On acknowledging that you are a sinner separated from God? On a man who claimed to be God incarnate? A man who claimed he could forgive your sins? Or on dead witnesses who say that he rose from the dead? On a religion that most of the world seems to reject. Nothing easy about it, is there? It's a clear message. It's a simple message. But it's not easy. There's no such thing as easy believism. The last time we were actually here in 1 Peter, which is some time ago now, we saw that we as a church are a chosen people, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Now, Peter, of course, was encouraging his first readers in the fact that although they were scattered through a massive geographical area, there was Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Well, I haven't got a map, but I tell you, it's a big place. Physically, they might feel very much alone and out of touch. They might feel stuck in a limb and feeling they're not much used to God or his people or for the extension of his kingdom. And Peter takes them right back to the promises of Scripture reminding them that God has got a purpose in everything. And despite the fact that they felt that they no longer belonged, Peter is making it clear. And this is as applicable to you and me as it was to them. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you belong to this invisible reality, to a nation that you cannot see, to a kingdom that we cannot touch with our hands. But one that is more real than the kingdom that we're living in right now. Because we are a people belonging to God. Now burn that into your soul, Christian. Because we are strangers here. We are a people of faith. Now faith is what? Being, come on, Hebrews 11.1. 1, sure of what we hope for and being certain of what? What we do not see. And quoting in the AV, I like that. It's very good. Okay. Now, because of this truth, we live by faith as a people with a function and a purpose. We are a people who are significant in the eyes of God. You know, if the world looked at us this morning, just an ordinary group of folks, they would look at us and say, we're not significant at all. But in God's eyes, we are a powerful people. Now, this fact should encourage us, not 
to be proud or superior, but to recognize that other people are significant too. And here is the spur to keep us persevering and not to give up. And what a great encouragement to know that we're no longer alone, to know that we are loved, to experience forgiveness for even our darkest sins, and to know that we are needed in this world. That there is a place for me with all my idiosyncrasies and eccentricities, oh yes, I've got them. The fact is there's a future hope, and so I no longer have to be afraid. Because I don't have to hold on to me anymore. I can loose it. I can loose this goodness of God into the world. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter uh, 4. And look at verse 15 through 18. Listen to this, it's beautiful. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. That's incredible, isn't it? There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Here they are scattered all over the land feeling very alone and Peter is saying look God loves you God has a purpose for you God has meaning for your life you belong to this kingdom that you cannot see but it's there you don't have to control it you don't have to administer it God does that for you so loose the freedom you know I read a story of a of a man who had been a collaborator with the Nazis in Europe and after the war finished, he went into hiding in his sister's house in the basement. And he lived there for 32 years. 32 years. Do you know, was that afraid? He said, he was, when he was found, he said that he used to cry when he heard people happy outside. He couldn't even go to his own mum's funeral because he was afraid he would be seen. And he said, throughout those years, I did nothing. I never left the house. I could only look at down at the village in the valley. See, fear is an awful thing. It's a thing that grips your soul and it refuses to let go. And just when you start to deal with a particular difficulty, fear roots itself deep in your imagination so that you can only think of the worst circumstances. Now, I don't know about any of you, but you may have done scary things. I've, I've been a bit of an adrenaline junkie in my time and I've always got to do something dangerous because... I was always told, when I went into the military first of all as a kid, if it makes you feel really nervous and scared, it's good for you. Because actually you're pushing the boundaries. Now a number of years ago, we, um, Paul and I, eldest boy and I, we decided that we would take part in a sponsored ab sale off the Hilton Hotel in Glasgow. And I have to say, it was a pretty easy ab sale actually. I don't know if you've done it, anyone done ab sailing? Great. Well, I, I think it's something we should do as a church. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should have sound of the time. You've done it. So we, maybe we should have sound of the time bridge or something in the wheelchair. Not even better. Well, you know, the idea of it was they, they stick this big pole out the side of the building. And actually, you're on that, right? You're, you control it all the time. It's not a free amp sound, but it's pretty scary. And the first thing they do is they say to the person who's scared, and actually you see some blokes and, and he, <laughs> no, this is great. And they, and they get you there, and it's a great feeling, you know, you get on the edge, and they, they get you, said, now, let the rope out, and you're, the, the building's there, you're like that, and you're suddenly at a right angle, and they say, now let go. <laughs> and they take a picture. I didn't have a picture, it cost too much, but the idea is just to get you to face your fear. See, the secret was, don't look down. But as I reflect on it, I thought it was more interesting that those watching were more fearful than those of us on the ropes. Now, I suppose you could spiritualize that if you wanted to. You know, sometimes the world is more fearful than we are in dire circumstances. And in a spiritual sense, you see, fear in whatever form causes us to doubt. And Satan is well aware of the mileage that can be gained from these seeds. And then the doubt can be planted in the soul of the Christian. And he knows that he can get you shying away from trusting God. 
The best way of dealing with it, you see, is to get stuck in with the life of faith. It doesn't mean that life won't be scary at times, but it does mean that you will be free. And freedom comes at a price. And of course, the ultimate price for our forgiveness and our salvation was paid by Jesus at the cross, wasn't it? Alan Stibbs, who said, this one event of the cross of Christ is a final revelation of both the character and consequence of human sin and of the wonder and sacrifice of divine love. The cost that we have to meet is that we have to be prepared to take up this cross daily if we are to be disciples of a crucified saviour. So what does that mean? Well, Jesus said himself, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life must lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world? yet forfeits his own soul. This doesn't mean that you and I have got to go around lugging a great big cross on our back. And I don't, I've been on some pilgrimage journeys in my time. And I've been fascinated by the amount of people that I've met on some of these journeys. And they have these great big crosses they carry around. You know? And I think, what a great witness, you know, good for them. I couldn't do it. But then they cheat, don't they? They put a little wheel on the bottom of it. <laughs> Now, I'm not criticising, honestly, I'm not. But the fact is, are you going to carry it or you're not? The cross that we carry doesn't come with wheels, all right? The cross that we carry is the cost. It means that daily we identify with Jesus in his servant attitude. We willingly give of ourselves in the service of God. Now, all this sounds grand, and we verbalise it with such confidence in such words, but when it comes down to it, Many of us actually don't feel that we can get that close spiritually. Because the fact is that we, don't, we get a little bit self-conscious. We know that God sees our every move and he reads our every thought. And he knows us just too well. So we're frightened to expose ourselves to him. But we're a people of faith, aren't we? And so we've got to be a people of action. And with some urgency... Peter reminds us again that we have cause for the confidence as the children of God. But our earthly lives must be lived in the light of what we are called to be. And this means that we have to get close to God. We have to expose our lives to him. There has to be an integrity that recognises that yes, we do fail. Yes, we do misinterpret. And yes, we are manipulative in regard to other people and our times and our circumstances in the vain attempt to justify our own actions. And every single one of you have done it, and so have I. But in our confession, there needs to, we need to see with the eye of faith that our God is the very essence of forgiveness. And to please him we don't need to be chasing our tails to make ourselves look good or feel good. We please him by throwing ourselves into his loving arms and recognising that despite our failure, he understands and he will continue to love us because he loves us, because he loves us, because he loves us, because he loves us. We need all of this insurance as Christian believers as we face life and engage spiritually in a very secular world. For those who are not Christian or have no thought of God, the way one behaves in this life is just of no consequence really. It's just you, you play with the cards you've been dealt with. As long as you don't get caught, that's what matters. It's almost anarchic, isn't it? The way people live. And many believe that life is just a game to be played and so you choose your own destiny. Or as I heard from a, an Indian Christian worker, as he was dealing with Hinduism, he said Hinduism is the manner of life in which um, we ex our experience determines how we are reincarnated into the next cycle of life. Now, if I was going to be reincarnated, I'd, be, I'd come back as one of them old dogs that gets kicked about, I'm sure of it. But you know something? That is fear. That is isolation. That is emptiness. That is faithlessness. That is no hope at all. True life, true freedom, is not about being caught in an endless cycle of fate. True freedom is when we get to that position where we don't have to prove anything to anyone anymore. 
And this is where we fail as Christians because we are obsessed with image. And we just can't blame it on the advertisers and all the stuff that's out there because when it comes down to it, you and I have to be accountable and decide what we're going to watch, what we're going to listen to, and what we're going to allow to be imbibed into our hearts. You know, one of my young servicemen, beast that he was, once bought me a, p a poster. I'm sure he was sending me a message. It was a poster of Goofy. And Goofy was looking in this mirror. And his belly was sagging. Okay? And his, his clothes were all fitting. But then he looked in the reflection. And he was Superman. <laughs> Don't laugh. That's one, of, that's one I see every morning. And I say, look, Mary, look, 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 look. Hurry up, hurry up. I can't hold it much longer. <laughs> For the unbeliever, this life is a playground designed so that they can, any individual can engage in their passion for whatever they want. But for the Christian believer, this life is a battleground where we have to face up to the lusts and the temptations and we have, a lift, have to live a life that is honouring to Christ. Now this might sound unattractive and boring to some, but what Peter is saying is that because we have a living relationship with the risen Christ... We cannot afford to be forever held up by our sin, which is actually foolishness. Selfishness in nature, or stupid in nature. We cannot allow ourselves to get sidetracked on some kind of guilt trip. We must take on board all the great promises and all the great assurances of God's word and live a life of freedom that God wants us to live. Now this is dealing with the image problem. And if we don't, then we... We can never love our neighbour. And we can never present ourselves to God as living sacrifices. And all because we don't like ourselves very much. Do you remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? What must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments, don't you? Don't murder, don't commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false temp testimony. Honour your father and mother and love your neighbour as yourself. He says, oh, this I've done since a boy. He says, ah, but one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. Now, that wasn't direct teaching on giving up your money and feeding the poor. It was direct teaching that the fact is this was a good guy. He could do all those things in practice, but his heart wasn't changed, and the priority in his life was his money. And he walked away sad. Because he wanted to deliver to Jesus what he felt he should deliver. It was his priority. His order. He didn't want, want, really want what God wanted. He wanted to please God. But he wanted to present an image of himself. He was goofy looking in the mirror. You're gonna, every time you close your eyes this week, you're going to see goofy looking in the mirror, aren't you? <laughs> you see, Jesus is equating the love of ourselves as an action against sin. If we don't have any respect of our, for our own being, we're never going to experience the love of God in our lives. The difficulty we have is that so many of us have been brought up on this philosophy, well, if it doesn't hurt, it's not worth having. And evangelical Christians are the worst, you know. Go to church for a good whipping, feel bad about yourself, then go and have roast preacher at lunchtime. Of course we should honour God as the Holy of Holies. We need to approach him with reverent fear. But you have to remember something else, Christian. He's also our saviour. And our friend. Our healer. Our comforter. Our companion. And he's our brother. So when you can come in prayer... There are times when we just have to worship his awesomeness. But there are times when you're just sitting in the car and you close the door and you say, oh, Lord. And you talk to him like he's your brother sitting in the next seat. That's the great thing about this relationship. That's what's real. That's what gives us hope. That's what gives us purpose. That's what gives us drives. That's what helps us persevere. That's what makes faith in Jesus real and not easy believism. 
and breaking through these barriers of formality that we've been that have been erected so skillfully to protect ourselves and our perceived theological purity under the guise that we're protecting God and his word it's the only way that we will be able to move into relationship with him and if we would just see it then we would be able to field all these insecurities and we would live wholesome lives See, we were a people of faith. We are meant to be a people of action. But I have to tell you this, we're a people who are being watched. Was it 1984, was it, the book about Big Brother? Yeah, we've all read it. And it's all coming true. Do you know there's more CCTV in this country than there was in the Eastern Bloc when the Iron Curtain was up? We are photographed and how many times today? Well, they know what, I don't know what they see when they see me. They see Goofy <laughs> looking in the mirror, and that's it. In the mirror, don't they? And here is the reason. Look at verse 11 and 12 in chapter 2 again. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives amongst the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. It's not about us, is it? Your lives are being watched, says Peter. The way that we live, not just in the places that we don't go to, but in the way that we conduct ourselves as free people. This has an effect on everyone who looks on. Our life in Christ, whether we like it or not, is under scrutiny. And folk will say that they don't care very much. But fundamentally, every single person out there is looking for security. So when the things that we've accumulated, like my old computer, when they go wrong, then there's nothing to pin your hopes and dreams on anymore, is there? And where do folk go when everything goes wrong? They go to the place where hope can be had. We were at the pictures the other day, and uh, we saw Captain America. It's great, I tell you, great, really great. In fact, I gave it a seven out of ten. That's how good it was. Okay, lots of loud bangs and people getting killed. shot up. No, it's not killed because no one dies in those sort of films. But you know, it's fantastic. But some of the trailers, you know, they you know, always put these daft adverts, and then you get the trailers. One of the trailers was for the new film Noah. Has anyone seen the trailer? Yeah, Google it, it's fantastic, you know? It's very interesting. And I, I've been thinking about that ever since. When the flood waters come in, the people rush for the ark. What is the hope people have when the flood waters come in? We are to live a clean life. And this is old ground, Peter is saying, but persistently it comes, it's stressing again and again the reasons why our, be our behaviour should be exemplary in Christ. Now we're talking about a guy here, and we mentioned in the house group the other night. Here's a guy who'd lived his life, who'd made his mistakes, and he was a bit of a slow learner. But when he learned his lesson, he learned it. And so he's worth listening to. That's why he's stressing it. He knows we're all a bit thick and we need to be told again. But he's saying, do your best. Be your best. And all that we have in him should mark us out as those that want to live a life to the full. That we are people that like ourselves and enjoy life. And this proves that we what we believe really works. You know, I know far too many miserable Christians. Do you? I know some really happy ones. Of course, you're all coming in that category. But, you know, I've met some really miserable Christians who moan about everything. I always try to say to people, how can you be miserable when you know you're going to heaven? And some people say, oh, no. We have no clue as to how many non-Christian folk are observing our lives. Maybe we'll never know. But it makes you think, doesn't it? And I want you to think on this. The moment you declare yourself to be a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, the non-believer will make a determination of the truth of the Christian message on the basis of how we live. In other words, you're the only Bible some people will read. It's no use saying that folk can think what they want. 
We have to, in all integrity, live out our faith as something that's as natural as life itself. So when we're sitting in the restaurant, I know it's a simple thing. When we sit in a restaurant and I start to eat, Mary says, Oi, what about prayers? It should be the most natural thing, shouldn't it? To pray in public. It should be the most natural thing to talk about Jesus in everyday conversation. That's how we gossip the gospel. We don't need... Well, maybe we can do some help, but we don't need an evangelist training. And you know, it will be noted the way in which we respond to those testing and stressful times, and maybe even more importantly, the way that we conduct ourselves with our families. You know, in 1805, a number of Indian chiefs met in a council at Buffalo Creek, New York, and they came to hear a presentation of the Christian message by a Mr. Cram from the Boston Missionary Society. I'm just reading this straight to you. After he'd finished speaking a, response, uh, speaking, a response was given by one of the leading chiefs, a man called Red Jacket. And he said, brothers, we are told that you've been preaching to the white people in this place. These people are our neighbors. We will wait, wait a while and see what effect your preaching has on them. And if we find it does them good, makes them honest and less disposed to cheating Indians, then we'll consider again what you've said. Here's the test, you see, to live consistently and without compromise. And this flies in the face of a consumer society that believes in a disposable everything. Just take a look around your industry. You'll see the demand. Everyone wants something now and they want it for nothing. Personnel are on a decrease, workload is on the increase, stress enters in. Who does it affect most? I'll tell you, it's the family. Do you see the undermining of family and society that's going on? Where the only thing that really matters is the right of the individual. And consistently, the agenda being um, pursued in our society, particularly by politicians, favours self-gratification that ignores the consequences which undermines the integrity of community so that we end up with a collection of individuals as someone once said acknowledging our neighbour only for what we can get not to make a community you see that's the paradox of our age we've got taller buildings but shorter tempers Wider roads, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, we, but we have less. We buy more, but we enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families. More conveniences, but less time. We have more decree, degrees, but less sense. We've got more knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, but more problems. More medicine, but less health. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too, too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry too quickly, stay up late, get up too tired, read too seldom, watch TV too much and pray too seldom. We've multiplied our possessions but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom and lie too often. We've learned how to make a living but not a life. We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but that we have trouble crossing the street to say hello to a new neighbour. We've conquered out the space, but we're not dealt with inner space. We've done larger things, but not better things. We got clean air, but we polluted our soul. We split the atom, but, we're, but not our prejudice. We write more, but we learn less. We plan more, but we accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. We have higher incomes, but lower morals. More food, but less appeasement. More acquaintances, but fewer friends. More effort, but less success. We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever, but have less communication. We've become long on quantity, but short on quality. You see, these are times of fast foods, slow digestion. We've got tall men and short character. We've got steep profits and shallow relationships. These are times of world peace but domestic warfare. More leisure and less fun. More kinds of food and less nutrition. These are the days of two incomes but more divorce. Of fancier houses but broken homes. These are the days of quick trips 
disposable nappies, throwaway morality, one night stands, overweight bodies and pills that do everything from cheer to quiet to kill. It's a time when we got so much on show in the shop front, in the shop front but we got nothing in the stock room. That's where we are. But we've got to live such good lives amongst the pagans and that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. We've got to leave no room for accusation and that's the integrity of the Christian walk and discipleship. You know, it was said of the Greek philosopher Plato as someone was slandering him. So what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, what I'll do is I'll live in such a way that no one will believe him. When we live in the Christian way, it might not sit right with your boss that you won't do that extra bit of overtime because you're spending time with your family. Or because it's Sunday and you'd rather be at worship. You might have to put up with some flack because the management system doesn't run as effectively as the model should do. But you'll be living honourably. You'll be discharging your ministry as a Christian family member, as a husband and a wife, as a father and as a mother, as a brother and as a sister. Because you know something, the workload will always be there. It will never be done. The most effective way to live out our testimony to Christ is the silent integrity of our character and the determination to, determination to live the Jesus way and when we are under pressure and not to conform to the pattern of the world which will eventually destroy us. The world must see our good deeds not because we are good people but because we are Jesus people. Clearly, you know, there has to be a practical expression of faith. Now, this is a really basic. If you're out walking along the road and you see someone laying in the gutter, clutching their chest and going blue, you don't say, oh, I wouldn't lay there, you'll get run over. you go and get them first aid, you'd get them to the hospital, wouldn't you? You know, one of the reasons Jesus' teaching on the Good Samaritan was so appealing to his, his hearers is because it was a stranger who helped the injured man. And I wonder, I just wonder if this is what Peter is really alluding to as he offers some teaching here. It doesn't matter what that these folks were separated by miles. It doesn't matter that they couldn't organise a praise gathering or some mission event together. What counts is not being slick and having it all together, but how compassionate and how willing and how prepared we are to help, the, uh, to help and to be there for others. You see... To live the Jesus way, it's only po an only possible expression in this world that can prove that we are free. And that is hope. And we continue next week. Shall we pray together? Now, Father, we recognise that many believers over the years have been isolated, felt very much alone. And have felt, even in the midst of the crowd, that they're the only one. But we thank you that in our Lord Jesus Christ, you have called us to be your children. By your spirit, you enable us to understand your will, to read what your purpose is, and to experience the real hope that is, is ours as your children. So that we don't have to be a slave again to fear, but we are free because of your love and your sacrifice. So as we enter into this week, we do ask you to help us to live the Jesus way to live the upside down world of Jesus and to be the example we're meant to be to be a people of faith to be a people of good works but also to be aware that we are being watched but we live for you we ask that the effect of our lives that we learn to love ourselves and to love you and to love our neighbour will be that many would desire to know you for themselves so help us to be good stewards, we pray. In Jesus' lovely name. Amen.